Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I'm your host, your DJ, your call center employee. Yeah, I've got the weird headset on. I don't want to explain. So uh, this week, we're going to be talking about only one author. I had originally, in the syllabus, I'd originally planned to talk about two authors this week. And then as I was writing my notes yesterday and today, I realized I have a lot to say about Sei Shonagon. And since you have a test this week, I also thought that maybe it would be better to focus on one author this week and not have as much reading to do before, you know, a fairly large assignment. So let's turn on our good old screen share. So that's the text for today, but to go back to our, I usually scroll down to where I need to be before I actually start recording, but today I'm a little bit behind. All right, there we go. So today we're going to be talking about um, the pillow book of Sei Shonagon. Uh, Sei was Sei Shonagon was born sometime around 965. Uh, her first, I guess you could say, major, the major first major thing that she did in her life was she became a court attendant to the Empress Taishi and was a sort of central figure in her like literary salon. Empress Taishi was really into all of the various fine arts, and so she surrounded herself with people who had a similar appreciation for you know the finer things in life. Um, it's also worth noting that Shonagon is from the Kiyohara clan. Um, this is a very storied Japanese family, not really necessarily a powerful family um, in ancient Japan, but it was known for producing a large number of scholars, artists, poets, you know, people whose, um, I guess you could say, facility with the finer things, as I mentioned before, was quite noted. And so Shonagon definitely sort of um, cleaved to type. The other thing that's worth noting, especially given our reading last week, is that she was a major rival to Murasaki Shikibu. Um, they were two very different personalities, and they kind of hated each other. <laughs> um, Murasaki most thought of Sei Shonagon to be like a really unserious person. It's like, oh, that's Sei Shonagon, she's so unserious. I'm a very serious writer. I study Chinese. I'm so special. And um, Sei Shonagon thought that Murasaki was stuck up, basically. Um, and so in these two women, and in fact, I guess it was probably better that I didn't pair Sei Shonagon with um, Kino Tsuriyuki, so that way we can sort of see this comparison in starker relief. The two women have very different approaches to like the situation of women in the Heian period. Um, as we can see from Murasaki's writing, both in the Genji, which you guys read, and but then also in her her Nikki, her her diary, which you guys did not read, she thought of like a woman's position in Heian society in very melancholic terms, um, and the ordinary situation of women was something to bristle at, to be sort of upset about, and you can see that especially in sort of like. Murasaki, both the, the character of Murasaki in the tale, who's a, very, who's a highly unusual woman, but then also the person of Murasaki Shikibu herself, you know, her, the fact that she was doted on by her father, she was very, very well educated, so well educated that she actually um, instructed the then empress in Chinese herself. So she was a very serious person. Whereas Sei Shonagon um, kind of loved her life and was really excited and thrilled by the, the times she lived in. Um, she recognized the situation of women as being fundamentally different from men and being more subject, but she was just much more upbeat about it. Um, hers was more a kind of like live and let live attitude, definitely sort of took things in stride and wasn't quite so self-serious about them. The other important thing to note about the difference between these two women is that while Murasaki's literary style is more introspective, she's very interested in like people's thoughts. She's very interested in feelings. She's very interested in social relationships, um, status, and all those sorts of things. Now, Shonagon is also interested in status, but um, her style is much more observational. She doesn't really get very much into people's inner thoughts and feelings. She is much more about sort of like observing what's going on around her and sort of faithfully recording how she feels about it rather than sort of creating these like elaborate psychological profiles like you see in Murasaki's work. 
So nowadays, the, um, the pillow book is technically classified as a zuihitsu, which it isn't really, <laughs> um, or I, I would argue isn't. Um, technically, it's a pillow book. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, in fact, it, the, you, can, you can tell by the, the Japanese title that it's, it's literally not a <laughs> it's, it's, it's a soulshi. It's a kind of notebook. So this is like so makura no so makura is the word for pillow. Makura no soulshi. So it's like a pillow notebook and literally quite literally a notebook you keep under your pillow. That's why it's called a pillow book. Um, and a pillow book is sort of like a like like I said, it's like a kind of notebook. It's not really a journal. It's the sort of thing that you record. I mean, as she says in you know the very last section that you guys read for today, that you'll read for today, that it's it's a kind of thing in which she records her observations or things that she found to be interesting, things that like she just wanted to keep. It's kind of like a literary keepsake device, if you will. So in that sense, it's like a journal in that it contains remembrances, but it's far more expansive than a journal is. Um, also, it's it's. So this term zuihitsu, uh, I'll skip this for a second. I'll come back to it. So the term zuihitsu literally means like to follow the brush. Um, so you see that. So you're sort of like following or following after brush. Um, it refers, at least in modern Japanese literature, to a kind of like anecdotal essay. And we'll actually see like zuihitsu literature in the next unit that we study um, this semester. But she gets sort of grouped in with people like uh, this guy who we actually will read in the next unit, Yoshida Kenko, because in she wasn't really, I mean, she was known as a writer um, in the Heian period, but she didn't really become like a canonical author until after the Heian period, in fact, well after the Heian period. And that was because she was sort of reimagined as like the progenitor or the point of origin for the, the Zuihitsu essayist that we, that we will read. And so, you know, they come well after her. And then after those guys became, and they were men, after those guys became famous, then at that point, she is sort of then re-understood as being their literary precursor. And that sort of is what lifts her up into, you know, the upper echelons of Japanese literary history. Um, but what's really unusual about Seishon Ngun's Pillow Book is that it's a literary text in the form of something that actually wasn't supposed to be published. And in the final section of the, the Pillow Book, you even see Shonagon herself kind of lamenting the fact that, you know, it got out into the public. That's an affectation. She she's actually super jazzed that people like it and people read it, or probably was super jazzed. This idea that it's like, oh, it's essentially a humble brag. She's like, oh, you know, I can't believe everybody found out that I was writing this thing that was clearly written to be read. Like the <laughs> um, the style of it is extremely literary, extremely elegant. It's very very it's very much the kind of thing that is written to be read. It's not just like haphazard notes at all. All right, so there are various types. So as a, as a form of like miscellaneous writing, there are a lot of different kinds of things in the pillow book. Um, one of them is, so the, the Japanese term for this is mono wa and the reason why it's sort of thing. And then this is the topic marker wa. So these sorts of things wa. And so there are two really kinds of lists. I have this one as list, but then also there's another kind of list. There's the, the adjective, so the adjectival lists. So this is the things that don't necessarily have, so in the sort of so-called um, monozukushi, those things are like things of a very specific character. So it's like, you know, this is a list of things that are beautiful. This is a list of things that sort of make you weep. This is a list of things that are hateful, a list of things that shouldn't be inside the house, you know, stuff like that. Whereas this is just sort of these sort of uncharacterized lists are things that you're supposed to understand as being beautiful or valuable in and of themselves. And it's this kind of list that actually opens the entire work. And it's this one right here. So it's really just a list of four things. So it's like, what's beautiful in spring? What's beautiful in summer? What's beautiful in evening? And what's beautiful in winter? So in spring, it is the dawn that is most beautiful. And what's interesting about this line, 
you know, I'm not. <sighs> so, okay, actually, I kind of want to make this point first. <laughs> so translations of the pillow book tend to interpolate quite a lot. And what I mean by interpolate is that they sort of st they add things for the purposes of for the purpose of you as a reader to better comprehend what is going on. She actually doesn't say all of this. And in fact, in really, she only says this. Harua akebono. So, in sp so harua, so in spring or springtime, akebono, the dawn. That's literally all it is. It there, isn't, there isn't even a copular verb. It's just in spring, the dawn. Or daybreak, actually. So it's, it's interesting that she uses the, the term um, akebono and not akizuki. Ak sorry, akazuki. Um, is because akebono refers to that like moment when like and she literally actually describes it so i'll just read it as light creeps over the hills their outlines are dyed a faint red and wisps of purplish color trail over them so this is like that immediate moment where sort of light has returned at the end of at the end of the night and sort of you see you know the the, the various sort of like salmon pink colors in the sky so she's referring to a very specific moment in time. It's not just like dawn as a general concept. It's dawn as a very precise moment. And the point of this is not to simply say, hey, you know, in spring, this thing is sort of nice. She's actually trying to get you to visualize it. Because by zoning in on a very specific moment, I'm going to see if I have any tea. No, I don't have any tea left in my thing. That sucks. By um, honing on, zoning in on a particular moment, She's actually trying to get you to visualize that thing precisely. And the reason why she wants you to visualize it in precise terms is because she wants you to have a similar experience of that point in time as to the experience that she herself has. I'm going to get a drop because my throat feels a little weird. I'm a little sick, so... I'm going to try and soldier through it, guys. I'll be okay. You don't have to worry about me. <laughs> you don't have to worry about me. Um, and in getting you to sort of sort of feel the this, this things the same way, so there's a, there's a kind of like sympathetic reaction that she's trying to elicit. In other words, this form of reading isn't just about sort of like, oh, that's a nice story, or, you know, that's an interesting way of seeing things. She's actually, as an author, is trying to cultivate you, you guys, right there in the camera, as a particular kind of reader. So as a refined woman of letters, she is trying to, I guess you could say, breed in you a similar sensibility. So the uh, whole idea is that the refined author is someone who sort of elicits the refined reader. So the author isn't just signaling to you that, you know, these are the important things in life. This is what a cultured person should know. But she is also, establishing her like in you know, she could have just said like you know in spring the you know in spring the you know this, this moment at dawn is a really nice thing as well as this as well as in other words it could be a lot like some of her later lists but in using this sort of like refined literary language this really evocative expression this really sort of detailed description of the moment in time and all of its various colors the whole point is that she's also trying, sorry, the additional point in it is that she's trying to establish herself as an authority on this subject. And so that if you, as the refined reader, are actually, so the, the sort of the literary character of these statements and the fact that, like, for example, the fact that she doesn't actually say this, the fact that she just says this, the whole point is that you're supposed to as a, as a cultured reader, you're supposed to actually understand implicitly what she's getting at without her needing to just come out and tell you. And so before I had talked about sort of the, the importance of this like um, aesthetic concept of mono no aware, this sort of like the, the pathos inherent in like transients and transient things like cherry blossoms and stuff like that, the passing of the seasons and so forth. But here we have a very different take on that concept because Shonogun's sense of transience is less of a kind of ah or ooh or aha moment. It's not, it's not actually 
the way I described it sort of generically when we were talking about the Kokinshu, where it's like a kind of getting caught up in the moment. For her, it's actually, she has a somewhat more cynical take on it. And you can see that in the way in which she sort of describes things that have kind of lost their luster or lost their appeal. And so if you look at the winner entry, this is this is a really fascinating. I mean, just this this right here, you could write an entire dissertation about. Imagine someone has already, but anyway, let's take a look at it. So she begins with the sort of what is the the captivating moment. She begins by sort of trying to elicit that experience. In winter, the early mornings, it is beautiful. In fact, I'm actually I'm going to try and remove the stuff that's been interpolated. In winter, the early mornings, when snow has fallen during the night when the ground is white with frost, or even when there is no snow or frost, but simply very cold, and attendants hurry from room to room, stirring up the fires and bringing charcoal. But as noon approaches and the cold wears off, no one bothers to keep the braziers alight, and soon nothing remains but piles of white ashes. So you, she begins with the sort of the initial invocation of the thing that is beautiful, the thing that is exceptional, the thing that you're really supposed to like focus your attention on. But she ends with this really just chilling moment, but as noon approaches and the cold wears off. In other words, this is sort of interesting because we think of cold as a kind of like negative sensation as something that's like, Ugh. but as the cold wears off, as that thing that sort of gets everybody invigorated and excited and moving around, no one bothers to keep the braziers light. No one bothers literally to tend to the thing that makes like all this nervous, excitement energy, you know, worthwhile. And soon nothing remains but piles of white ashes. And so there is a bit of an allegory here. Japanese writers, especially this period, are not really very allegorical, but I think there is a bit of an allegory here where the the piles of ash are not just the sort of the ash that's left over from you know the brazier that hasn't had any charcoal or you know wood or anything flammable added to it but also ash in this case is sort of symbolic of cremation and so there's a kind of figurative death in this case it's not the death of a person it's the death of a kind of it's the death of the moment really it's sort of the death of that experience, that sudden like flash of people, all that nervous energy, all that excitement. And then when there's no reason to have all that nervous energy, when there's no reason to be excited or to be, to be caught up in the moment, all of a sudden you're left with this sense of like a kind of passing of like something having literally died and that's sort of captured in this image of the piles of white ash. But well, actually, oh, sorry, that, I forgot about that. Um, there's one more thing about the piles of white. Like, again, I, I said you could probably write a dissertation about this, <laughs> and somebody almost certainly has. But there's also the comparison between sort of the piles of white ash as this sort of like blank emptiness, but then compare that to, you know, the ground when it is white with frost which is much more, which is also a kind of blankness, but that blankness is more akin to like a blank canvas, something you know, upon which you can paint your own feelings, your own like aesthetic sensibilities, but the, you know, the pile of white ash, another kind of blankness is just sort of a death. It's just sort of an absence. It's a kind of meaningless absence. So another major difference between um, Shonagon's writing and Murasaki's is that you get a lot more sort of funny anecdotes in, um, Say Shonagon's writing than you really do in in Murasaki. Murasaki, I don't know, like she's a great, she's an amazing writer, and she's really sort of, she's good at the thing she does, which is sort of like introspection and like psychological like intrigue and things like that. What she's not good at is, you know, fun. She's not a fun writer. <laughs> like Say Shonagon is a much more fun writer, and probably why I prefer Say Shonagon is because she's just more fun. She's a snarky lady, and I like her a lot. Um, but that that's just sort of really the difference between the two. And it's not necessarily that one is better than the, I mean, I obviously prefer one over the other, but one is not inherently better than the other. And so, but I also want you to bear in, but the reason why I bring this up is because I want you to compare it to how earlier I was talking about the fact that, you know, in this period, the monogatari, the, the, the tale, the fictional tale was more highly valued than sort of the prose chronicle, things like the Kojiki, precisely because it reflects a broad range of human experience. And so Seishonagon really, in many ways, epitomizes that. She, so 
I particularly want to focus on the story of this dog, <laughs> Okinomaro, because it's interesting. It begins kind of humorously. So it's the cat who, it's interesting that so these are the traditional Japanese, the, the sections don't actually have titles, um, but these are sort of like the traditional Japanese titles for some of the sections. In fact, I think some of them actually Ivan Morris appends himself. Um, in, in the Japanese, they're, they usually just have, they're just numbered. Then <laughs> they don't really have any. So the fact that this is about a cat when it's actually mostly about the dog. <laughs> so th there's this, you know, funny little cat and dog chase. You know, the dog is chasing the cat and the cat flees to the emperor. The emperor picks up the cat and he starts petting and he's like, no, bad doggy. And then there's this sort of silly moment where the dog here, the dog is exiled. <laughs> but, and it, it's this, this, this passage right here. It was about noon, a few days after Okinomaro, Okinomaro's banishment, that we heard a dog howling fearfully. How could any dog possibly cry so long? All the other dogs rushed out in excitement to see what was happening. Meanwhile, a woman who served as a cleaner in the palace latrines ran up to us. It's terrible, she said. Two of the chamberlains are flogging a dog. They'll surely kill him. He's being punished for having come back after he was banished. It's Tara, <clears throat> Tara Sunefsa. We're beating him. Obviously, the victim was Okinomaro. I was absolutely wretched and sent a servant to ask the men to stop. But just then, the howling finally ceased. He's dead, one of the servants informed me. They've thrown his body outside the gate. Whoa. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it takes it. Like, so there's this sort of funny tale, and the, you know, the dog, and the, the, you know, the haughty dog, and he's swaggered away, and he's going off into doggy exile. But then he tries to come back because he's a dog, and he wants to be around people and other dogs. And these two jerk courtiers beat the crap out of him. And then just say Shonagon drops this bomb shit. It's not true. Uh, the dog's alive. But still, in the moment in the story, like, she drops this complete bombshell on you, and it's like, whoa and this is something that she is masterful at she like sort of sets you up to sort of think in one direction but then you know drops something right on top of you that sort of like wrenches you back into the moment and it's always about the moment for her that sort of that that immediate like momentary sensation it's like how did you how would you feel how did i feel at that specific time and i want and so the way she writes it the way she tells the story is designed to elicit in, in many ways these stories aren't really about what they're about i mean that, that may sound strange like the content of, of what happens is less important it's not unimportant it's less important than the reaction that it elicits in you as a reader or rather the reaction that it should elicit in you as a refined reader like if you are the appropriate kind of reader, the kind of reader that, that say Shonagon is trying to cultivate, then you will see the pathos in this moment. You will feel what she felt. And so she's modeling that for you so that you as like a human being can actually understand what that is. It's really just kind of a gut-wrenching story. And then when Okinamaro comes back and they don't, they don't really believe that it's the same dog. And there's this moment when, okay, so he comes back after having had the crap beaten out of him here. And then on the following morning, so that's uh, starting this paragraph here. On the following morning, I went to attend the empress while her hair was being dressed and she was performing her ablutions. I was holding up the mirror for her when the dog we had seen on the previous evening slunk into the room and crouched next to one of the pillars. Poor Okinamato, I said. He had such a dreadful beating yesterday. How sad to think he is dead. I wonder what body he has been born into this time. Oh, how he must have suffered. And so there's a bit of a playful. It's like, oh, maybe he's been reincarnated. It's the same. It's actually the same dog. And she's being a little playful, but at the same time, she's sort of like pulling the playfulness out of that sense of melancholy. At that moment, the dog lying by the pillar started to shake and tremble and shed a flood of tears. It was astounding. So this really was Okinomaro. On the previous night, it was to avoid betraying himself that he refused to answer to his name. So the reason why they didn't believe it was the same dog is because they tried to call to him and he didn't answer to it. But what's interesting about this statement right here is that he was too proud to admit that 
he had become, this is a dog, by the way, that we're talking about. He was too proud to admit that he'd become this wretched creature that he wouldn't even answer to his own name. But then he's reduced to such a state that he has to come crawling back and finally sort of when that facade of like noble stoicism breaks down, like that's when they, that's when, you know, the women of this court accept him back in and he's sort of allowed. It's, it's when he becomes, when he, well, he's not a human being, but when he sort of demonstrates like this full range of like emotional capabilities that he is then brought back into court society. So in many ways, it's, again, it's a kind of allegory for the situation of the reader, but it's sort of complicated because you could actually take it one of two ways. You could take the story as a sort so there are in, in this period, um, stories of like exile and banishment and sort of all of like the, the moaning and the sadness and the depression, the results from that, they were fairly common. In fact, actually, there's a, there's a really famous like sequence, a series of chapters in the Genji when Genji is banished from the capital and all the things that happen as a result. Um, one way you could read this is that because this is all happening to a dog, <laughs> You could read it as a kind of satire of that sort of story. Or at the same time, you could also think of it as, in a sense, elevating the dog. And what I mean by that is that there is a, it's not just sort of like thinking of like the meanest creature in the noblest terms, but also it goes back to this um, thing that we saw in sort of the, the common esoteric Buddhism of the period, this belief in the so-called Buddha nature. And that's why, you know, it's important to, to note that she, this is characterized as like Okinamaro, be, it's a joke, but he's characterized as being reincarnated. Because the whole point is that sort of like, even this lowly creature, this dog, <laughs> this random dog, got the crap eaten out of it, um, has that sort of at least the kernel of that Buddha nature with within him, the ability to sort of aspire to something more than what he is in sort of in the most in the basis sense. Um, <laughs> the other thing that's worth noting about um, Seishonagon is she definitely does not like she is she is definitely a masterful humble bragger. She's 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 a big fan of the humble brag. And <clears throat> There's this moment where like one of her poems gets used and she says here at the bottom of page 145, when I heard his majesty tell this story, I was so overcome that I felt myself perspiring. It occurred to me that no younger woman would have been able to use my poem and I felt very lucky. This sort of test can be a terrible ordeal. It often happens that people who usually write fluently are so overawed that they actually make mistakes in their characters. So this sort of like, you know, typically, <laughs> typically this is what would happen to an ordinary woman. But I, oh, but I was, just, I was, I was completely out of sorts. Like, but she's insinuating that she's not an ordinary woman by any stretch of the imagination. And that is sort of the, what follows then feels like a kind of non sequitur, but in many ways it, it follows directly out of that, this idea of sort of like, the exceptional woman within the context of, you know, a, a particular set of social circumstances. And so then there is this test involving the, the Kokinshu where the Empress tries to get, where the Empress will read out, you know, the first half of particular poems and then see how many of her courtiers can remember the second half and all of the women do terribly. And so then this leads her to tell this story of this woman who was a consort to the Emperor Murakami, and this is, starts at the bottom of page 146. She says, Emperor Murakami, continued Her Majesty, had heard this story and remembered it years later when the girl had grown up and become an imperial consort. Once, on a day of abstinence, so l literally this means like, I mean, it means pretty much exactly what it says. It's a, it's a day when it is inauspicious to have sex. So on a day when the emperor was prevented th through for divine reasons from getting it on, he came into her room, hiding a notebook of Kokinshu poems in the folds of his robe. He surprised her by seating himself behind a curtain, and then he just describes this moment, and then he's, he thinks to himself, like, oh, you know, eventually she'll, she'll screw up and she'll get one wrong, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end the trial and be like, ha, 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 you're just a silly woman. But that is... Not what happens. <laughs> she actually does so well 
that the Emperor Murakami gets frustrated and it says here at the top of page 147, after a time, the emperor began to resent the lady's flawless memory and decided to stop as soon as he detected any error or vagueness in her replies. Yet, after he had gone through 10 books of the Kokinshu, he had still not caught her out. At this stage, he declared that it would be useless to continue. Marking where he had left off, he went to bed. What a triumph for the lady. And so the reason why sort of Empress Teishi through Seishonagon tells this story, the story of a woman like besting literally the emperor, you know, at, at his own game. The point of this story is not just to sort of chastise her courtiers for not, you know, being able to recognize more than a handful of poems from this, you know, well-loved imperial anthology, but also to show what a woman of refinement and substance can achieve even in this mostly patriarchal world. Like this, this is what like a woman can be despite her circumstances. And so again, it goes back to that notion that like the situation of women in this period is not something to be lamented, but something to sort of be understood and gamed and worked. It's not this like, oh, woe is me kind of situation. So the last type of like thing that were well, released of the ones that I'm going to talk about in the the pillow book are the so-called um, monozukushi, which are like adje list, adjective lists is usually what they're called in English. Um, <clears throat> so like things that are depressing, things that are hateful, things that are um, under your desk, things that are bright red, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and again, the, the point, so, how should I put this? Well, actually, let's take a look at this one right here, the one on page 148. So remember, all of these things are things that are, made, that are kind of like sad. It's like, <sighs> but not depressing in the like, you know, morose sense, but depressing in the kind of like <sighs> sense. And so this one is a good example of that. Again, I'm not gonna, go with the interpolated part. One has written a letter, taking pains to make it as attractive as possible, and now one impatiently awaits the reply. Surely the messenger should be back by now, one thinks. Just then he returns, but in his hand he carries not a reply, but one's own letter, still twisted or knotted, as it was sent, but now so dirty and crumpled that even the ink mark on the outside has disappeared. Not at home, announces the messenger, or else they said they were observing a day of abstinence and would not accept it. And then um, Morris adds, oh, how depressing. So there's that kind of like a self-deprecating moment here. Like Seishonagon is not above t taking herself down a peg. Like she, she thinks highly of herself, but also at the same time is not like, she understands the kind of humorous or like the sort of dark comedy of of life, of, of, of the way the world is, of things not always going your way. Um, and you can also sort of see this in... Okay. This one right here on page 150. One has sent a verse that turned out fairly well. How depressing when there was no reply poem. Even in the case of love poems, people should at least answer that they were moved at receiving the message or something of the sort. Otherwise, they will cause the keenest disappointment. So here we see a kind of secondary aspect of this. It's not just that <coughs> I say Shonagon is lamenting this, like, or like, oh, how depressing it is and what this happened. But it was also kind of like a, there's a kind of hint here. It's like, nudge nudge it's like this is depressing but also it's sort of reminding you it's a way of again we're cultivating a refined reader it's a way to remind you as someone who lives in this society who aspires to be like a seishonagon that you don't do this <laughs> like this is depressing don't do this to people don't just not send a reply at all like there there are many moments in this text where it's like you're supposed to understand that there is there's this particular kind of behavior being modeled for you and you need to accept it and do it 
Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, whatever. <laughs> I'm just going to pass that. Okay, so then the hateful things section on page 151, because I don't want this, this lecture video to run too long. Um, let's see, one part of two. Oh, yeah. Right here on the bottom of page 151. She says, to envy others and to complain about one's own lot, to speak badly about people, to be inquisitive about the most trivial matters and to resent and abuse people for not telling one, or if one does manage to worm out some facts, to inform everyone in the most detailed fashion as if one had known all from the beginning. This is sort of an interesting um, take that she has here because this society that they live in is like a hyper vigilant one. Everybody's always up in everybody else's business. And Seisho Magon, very uncharacteristic for this period, has a kind of live and let live attitude. And in many ways, is kind of um, doctrinaire about it. It's like you shouldn't measure things by what other people have and you shouldn't overly complain about your own situation in life. But again, there's this sort of thread that runs the entire text of doing the best with what you have, taking things in stride. Like even when something that annoys you happens, you don't, so like think, think about this. Compare like what Seishonagon is saying here to what happens to Lady Urokujo in the Genji. Like when she is slighted, when someone, like literally what happens is someone pulls up their carriage and in front of her so that she can't see Genji and then Genji doesn't look at her when she passes. And this makes her so mad in addition to a bunch of other things, obviously, but this makes her so mad that her spirit then literally assaults Genji's wife causing her ultimately to die. It's not a direct cause, but it sort of is a proximal cause of her death. Whereas what Seishonago is saying here, it's like, get over it, get over yourself. Like, it's not a big deal. <laughs> um, like things that annoy, things will happen that annoy you, things that will happen that upset you, that depress you, but sort of what you do with it, like how you experience things, like how you understand them, how you like make use of those moments in your life. That's what matters far more than, you know, your revenge against some random woman or this lover that you have this weird obsession with. So you can see how, you know, say Shonagon and Wurosaki Shikibu would not really get along with each other. And also, again, thinking about sort of the relationship between this text and, and the Genji, there's this really humorous it's a hateful thing, but it's also meant to be read as kind of funny. So starting on 152, a gentleman is visited once secretly. Although he's wearing a tall lacquered hat, he nevertheless wants no one to see him. He is so flurried, in fact, that upon leaving, he bangs into something with his hat. Most hateful. It is annoying, too, when he lifts up <coughs> the eel blind that hangs at the entrance of the room that lets it fall with a great rattle. If he is a head... If it is a head blind, things are still worse. For being so more solid, it makes a terrible noise when it is dropped. There is no excuse for such carelessness. Even a head blind does not make any noise if one lifts it up gently on entering. And again, there's the sort of like manual nature to this. Like, you know, if he weren't such a clod, he would have lifted it up gently on entering and leaving the room. The same applies to sliding doors. If one movements are rough, even a paper door will bend and resonate when opened. But if one lifts the door a little while pushing it, there need be no sound. So there's this like, she gives you this image of a guy who's just like a total unrefined weirdo. And you know, maybe he's kind of hot and maybe you're into him. But then when he shows up, he's just like, banging the pots and he's like oh i'm sorry dear oh, i'm sorry i just tripped over my shoes oh boy i was just so excited to see you today and her reaction is just like uh... <laughs> and so but again she's the kind of person who takes it in stride and uses this as a kind of instructive moment the point is like hey hey do hey 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 fellas if you want to get with me don't do this this sucks. 
Uh, yeah, and so like compare that to you know like Genji and all the various women that he romances, like all of those moments when he's just like he slides in and he insinuates himself, and the woman's like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. Whereas this gives you like something, and it's interesting. I talked about how um, the Genji is in many ways about the women, but there is a like a woman's perspective that you don't really see in the Genji, and that perspective is really Shonogon's, the one where it's like the woman who is irritated with the man not not the not the woman who is like embarrassed that he says oh like oh what are we gonna do oh who who will i tell no the woman who's just like oh my god what is wrong with you <laughs> um so okay so with that that said all those comparisons with um the genji let's take a look at the the very last section on page 160 you, i mean you could read the, the other stuff too but it's it's more or less I don't want this lecture to be super long. <clears throat> so she says in the second paragraph of this section, I wrote these notes at home when I had a good deal of time to myself and thought no one would notice what I was doing. Again, this is an affectation. Everything that I've seen and felt is included. Everything that I've seen and felt. Think about that, that statement for a second. The full range of human experience. I didn't want to leave anything out. I wanted you to sort of understand things as I felt them, as I saw them. Since much of it might appear malicious and even harmful to other people, I was careful to keep my book hidden. Really, were you? But now it has become public, which is the last thing I expected. Yeah, sure. Again, I mean, there's a kind of disingen there's a kind of like literary disingenuousness here. Like she has to say this, and it's like, oh, I, I never thought any of these things would get out. But, but by the way that they're written, why, given the sort of the careful way in which they're expressed, you, you'd have to imagine that she, like, even if she didn't think people would read it, like she has a kind of like hypothetical reading in mind. Like it's, it's being written to be read even if never actually by like a real person. And then she ends with this bit at the very bottom of the page. Whatever people may think of my book, I still regret that it ever came to light. Again, the sort of like affected positions. Like, no, no, she really doesn't regret it. But again, she has to sort of say this for the purposes of this particular collection of things. And so with that under screen share. So that's it for this week. Um, I will have my test posted, your test and mine. It's ours. It's really our test when you think about it. We'll be posted shortly. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, always feel free to email me. There's my office hours on Wednesday. And um, yeah, so get in touch. Um, if, yeah, I'm just going to end. Let's stop. I'm back.